well, lovely to meet you in person. Well, likewise in person anyway. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I really have enjoyed your videos, and uh, for me, that that kick started a whole whole new interest in in neuroscience. Um, I had been studying some of this stuff about twenty years ago when I was doing my teacher training, and so much has changed in that time as well. You know, there's been the whole thing about um, learning myths and everything else. I'll come back to that in a minute, but um, so much has changed. But um, it's it, you know, you're responsible for kickstarting a whole new learning in, in me, and I've become a student of neuroscience. So um, I'm enjoying every minute of it, and I've certainly uh, found it's affected my performance and uh, my practice habits as well. So I've, I've kind of got a structure. I don't know how much we're going to get through. I've got about a thousand questions. <laughs> but uh, but uh, things I want to look at, uh, uh, obviously, neurons, then um, you, the student, uh, focus, memory. Um, Deliberate practice is, is one thing that um, I think everything's going to sort of revolve around. Yep. Um, interleave practice, space learning, uh, sleep, which is one of your favorites, as yep. uh, well, well we know. Uh, retrieval, visualization, visualization, mental practice, uh, when and where. And then maybe a look at the, what the future might hold technology wise, you know, what, what, yeah. what is out there that can help us musicians uh, learn more quickly. So um, neurons first, I guess, um, a, a brief description, perhaps? Sure. So um, <laughs> neurons are the cells in our brain, right? They do everything that allows us to do everything we, we do. Um, and that's through how they communicate with each other, that they, they spit out chemical messages, which are then translated into electrical messages. And um, yeah, that communication between neurons is what allows us to do what we do. And the, there's a saying in neuroscience, neurons that fire together, wire together. People have probably heard that before, right? Yes, Heb, yes. Right. Um, and so what that means is that when two neurons are, their, their activity is sort of linked in time in a, in a precise way, those neurons basically get better at communicating with each other and they undergo sort of structural change to allow that to happen. And this is known as neuroplasticity. Right, exactly. So uh, th there seems to be s stages through which, which the brain goes through uh, when, when it's undergoing neuroplasticity, as it were. Um, so would the first step be uh, dendritic growth, uh, the, the, the dendrites which are attached to neurons go out and find other connections, then the, uh, the synapses themselves become uh, enlarged LTP, long-term potentiation, and then myelination seems to be a follow-on from that. Is, is there a sort of stage in which uh, learning takes place. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's basically exactly what happens. And learning is taking place at all those stages without those, those changes happening, you can't actually learn or get better at things. There's another stage that is really important when we're, when we're kids and growing up, which is actually pruning. Um, so we, right. We tend to think that learning is, you know, new, new synapses being formed and neurons connecting with each other that hadn't connected before, but actually most of the change that happens in our brains growing up is actually pruning that our, our brains are taking away connections that it doesn't need um and so that's that's actually the more important process that happens when we're growing up this is the difference between a, a young child learning uh, viola for instance quite easily and a 30 to 40 year old taking a little bit longer with all this right exactly yeah so um oh, what are the main things that spark neuroplasticity? You know, when you go into the practice room, what, what, are, what are the things that are really going to help this process along? Right. Believe it or not, making mistakes. Nobody likes making mistakes, right? Like it doesn't feel good to make mistakes. But I was going to come to that. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt again because uh, Andrew Huberman did an interesting yes. podcast about this. So yeah, please. Right. So yeah, I mean, when you when there's a mismatch between what you want to happen and what actually happens, like I'm trying to play this thing on my instrument, and I know it's supposed to sound like this, but it comes out sounding different when there's a mismatch that's a signal to your brain that okay wait a minute something needs to change because if there's no mismatch you try to play this and it sounds exactly like you thought it was supposed to that tells your brain yep we're good we got it like everything's fine but when there's a mismatch that tells your brain okay wait something's not right we we need to make adjustments here 
And that's, that's how you learn by making those adjustments. A lot of times people like to, you know, play the part they're already good at over and over again, because it it feels good, but you're not actually learning anything, right? When you're, when you're doing that, all you're doing is confirming to your brain. Yeah, we got everything. Everything's good. No need to change. So you have to make mistakes in order to learn. And and that's a very interesting aspect because, uh, a lot of educators would say when you go into the practice room, you know, first time, perfect first time, that kind of thing, um, which I can understand to a certain extent. You know, it, it makes sense to play something and, and get it right first time. Otherwise, you know, we don't want to go down the dirty socks route to quote yourself. But, <laughs> but um, so, so on, on the other side of that, if, if we do play it right first time, perhaps it's it's um, getting into the, the realm of desirable difficulty, perhaps if we up the tempo or change the rhythm and make things a little bit more difficult for ourselves, then we start to create neuroplasticity and, and the learning becomes more more consolidated. Right. I mean, there there is a balance between like, you have to, you have to make mistakes in order to learn, but you also have to solidify things when they're right, right? You can't, a lot of students will, you know, make mistakes and, and figure out, Oh, this is how you do it. And then they get it right once. And then they think they have it for forever. And no, no, you don't like, you got it right. Once you got it wrong, like a million gazillion times, you have to do it correctly more times than you did it incorrectly to, to solidify that pathway in your brain. And that's where repetitions come in. And people don't tend to like repetitions because they're boring. Right. Um, but if you only do it right once your chances of getting it right again tomorrow are pretty small. Right. Um, and so you, you need to do repetitions to, to solidify it. Um, Mm -hmm. one of my favorite things to do to make repetitions more interesting, and this is what you're getting at with desirable difficulty, because it does make it a little more difficult is to do each repetition in a different emotion. So even if I'm just practicing something very mechanical, it's music, right? It has expressive intent. And if I pick a different emotion for each repetition, it's going to be more interesting, right? For me to try to do it, but it's also going to be more difficult, right? For me to try to do it. Cause now I'm I'm thinking about something else. Um, And maybe if it's something that's very mechanically, very difficult for me to do, I'm going to pick emotions that are very close to each other. Like, happy, joyful, excited, right? Those are close to each other. If it's, if it's a happy passage, if it's something that mechanically is not that difficult, I just need to solidify it to make sure I can do it sort of automatically. I might pick emotions that are totally the opposite of each other. I might do happy and then angry and then fearful. And you know, that's (laughs) difficult. If the passage doesn't sound like that, how are you going to make it sound that way? Right? Yeah. So that's, that's bringing a lot of cognitive, um, a, a different cognitive angle to, to the same phrase then. Exactly. Well, and it forces you to focus, right? Like one of the worst things you can do is mindless repetitions, because if you're not focused, then your, your brain isn't going to be paying attention. It's not going to hold on to that information as well as if you're really, if you're really focused and paying attention. And, and that brings me nicely onto the, the student themselves. Um, uh, I see that I see there's a couple of th- things the, will probably help you before you even get to the practice studio. You know, you've, you've got goals, uh, motivation, you know, purpose, uh, finding passion within your music, that sort of thing. So are there, there are certain things that can help um, goal setting, motivation, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the most important thing is always having a goal when you practice something. A lot of students will sort of play mindlessly and not have like a specific goal in mind for that practice session or that portion of the practice session. And they'll just kind of like play around until they find, Oh, maybe I'll work on this today. And I liken that to getting in your car, driving around randomly and then getting home and being angry. You didn't go to the grocery store. Like you didn't have a plan to go to the grocery (laughs) store. That's why you didn't go, you know? And so you always have to have a goal and those goals. Sometimes my goals for my practice sessions are extremely specific. I need to fix the intonation on measure two of bar five, I need to solidify the rhythm in bars 10 through 12. I need to, you know, sometimes it's extremely specific like that. Sometimes it's more open-ended. It's, you know, this section that's maybe a a page long, something is not working about the pacing. The phrasing is fine, but the pacing is off. Mm. And I need, I don't know why I need to figure it out. That's a much more open-ended issue, right? Then I need to fix beat two of bar five. Um, But I have a goal, right? And I know, 
I am working towards this goal and I'm going to pick practice strategies that are going to help me achieve that goal. And so that's the first thing, always having a goal. And then while you're practicing, making sure that everything you do has a very clear and specific purpose. I say to my students that somebody should be able to come into your practice room at any point and say, what are you doing and why? And they shouldn't have to think about it, right? They should be like, I'm doing this because of X, Y, Z, and it's going to help in this way, right? You should be able to Bit easily- pressure as well. <laughs> right. And one thing I recommend to students who, who tend to, who maybe know this, but tend to sort of start practicing mindlessly and aren't really paying attention is set a timer to go off every five, 10 minutes or something. Every time it goes off, stop. Can you articulate what you're doing and why? If you can't, you're probably practicing mindlessly and that's not, that's not very good in terms of motivation. So a couple of things about that. First, I say to my students that, so what most people think of in terms of motivation is I need to feel motivated to practice, right? It's hard for me to practice because I don't feel motivated. And my answer to that is it's irrelevant. Whether you feel motivated, you pick up the instrument, whether you feel like it or not, that's what we do as creative professionals. And, you know, if you talk to writers, artists, dancers, like in any creative field, they will tell you, you just sit down and you do it. It's your job. You know, somebody that works in, I don't know, a law firm or a department store or a gas station or anything like they don't get up in the morning and say, do I feel motivated to go to work today? Right. You go to work. That's your job. And you do your job. Same thing with practicing. You do it kind of whether you feel quote unquote motivated or not. And once you build a habit of consistent practice, the motivation follows because when you have that consistent practice, you start really seeing your results and then you want to practice more. And so I think people put the cart before the horse. They think, Oh, I have to feel motivated in order to practice. No, just go practice. And that will make you feel more motivated. But I understand that it can be hard to start practicing, to get your instrument out of the case and just go. Mm -hmm. And there are people that research this type of thing. Like, how do you get yourself to do things and create good habits and things like that? And one of the overwhelming things that comes up over and over again is you need to create systems in your life that make it easy to do the right thing, whatever habit you're trying to cultivate and harder to do the wrong thing. And one of the things that makes it easier to do what you want to do is to not have to make the decision in the moment. So if you have to make the decision in the moment, yes. when should I practice? Should I practice? Probably it's not going to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you have made the decision ahead of time that at two o'clock on Thursdays, I practice, or after I finish eating lunch, I practice, right. If you've already made that decision, then you don't have to make it in the moment. Then there isn't that friction of making the decision. You just, you just do it. Um, so setting up systems in your life. So you don't actually have to make decisions. You just do it. Structure in other words. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So coming back to focus, um, and, and also you were talking about mind wandering. Um, I, hmm. I remember I, was, I sent you, um, I was just looking into the default mode network and, right. um, uh, the, executive control network and right. uh, one seems to be um default mode network seems to be the mind wandering state um uh, also the some people call it the imagination network and um, the other one the the, the uh, attention network or, or task positive network it seems to have a lot of names all the mm -hmm. you know, all, all of these uh, connected areas within the brain but um uh, just being aware of them i would imagine it would be quite important you know to be aware of the fact actually I'm thinking about dinner I'm not thinking about playing the scale that sort of thing right yeah I mean when we practice we want to be focused right we don't want our mind to be wandering at other times we do want our mind to be wandering right because it's still going to be working on problems in in the in the background but when you're practicing you want to be focused and I think a lot of times people's mind wanders when they're practicing. Well, for a couple of reasons, one, you may be practicing for too long, right? We, we don't really have the ability to focus, focus for very long at a stretch without a break. People think that they can practice well for two, three hours at a time. No, you can't. <laughs> you have to take breaks. That's way too long. You're not going to be focused. Um, but also learning to really focus is a skill that you have to learn. And it's, it's difficult to focus like that, right? And so I think people also think they should automatically be able to focus for long periods of time. Should you automatically be able to go out and run 10 miles? No, like that's, that's a skill that you have to train for, right? <laughs> 
towards that. Yeah. Right. And so focus is the same thing. And so with my students, if they have trouble focusing, I say, set your phone for five minutes, set a five minute alarm, focus for five minutes and that's it. Then take a break. That may seem really short. It may seem I should be able to focus longer than that, but that's fine. Like start with a very short amount of time. See if you can keep focused for that five minutes. If you can, great, take a little break and then set a timer for a little bit longer, six minutes, 10 minutes, and gradually increase the amount of time that you're, you're able to focus. And over time, just like running or anything else, you'll, you'll get better at it. You'll have more stamina. Mm, interesting. And it, it also seems that uh, the, the default mode network, like you were saying, imagination and creativity, it seems to be the, the domain of people who improvise or are trying to, to write something new, perhaps. Uh, but learning is definitely the the the, the focused uh, executive control network side of things. Right. Yeah. In order to learn, you have to be focused. Yeah. Yeah. You can't have your mind wandering. Mind wandering has other purposes, but not if you're actively trying to learn and get better at something, you have to be focused. Yeah, indeed. What, what do you think about um, things like the Alexander technique? You know, just being aware of your posture, that sort of thing, mindfulness. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the Alexander Technique. It totally changed my life, actually, um, in, in so many ways. But yeah, and like mindfulness and mindfulness meditation, I used to think that the purpose of that was to like learn to relax and not be so stressed out all the time. But actually the purpose of mindfulness and the purpose of Alexander Technique and all of these sort of mindfulness-based practices, yoga, Feldenkrais, is to give you better control over your brain that you can control what your mind is doing. And that as a performer is such an important skill, right? We like, you're always going to have stray thoughts coming through your mind. It's that that's the, the purpose of meditation is not to like clear your mind of mind wandering and stray thoughts. That's not like literally that's not possible, yeah. but the purpose of practicing mindfulness is that when a stray thought comes through your mind, it just passes through and it passes on and you don't kind of, Oh, look, and you follow it and you get distracted, right. That you're able to let go of that. And that's hard to do, right. A stray thought comes into your mind. Oh my gosh, I totally forgot to buy bread. What am I going to eat for breakfast tomorrow? <laughs> and then, you know, no, you forgot to buy bread. Okay. That's fine. You're performing right now. Like you can get the bread later. Um, but that's a skill also that you have to cultivate. And, you know, as performers, when we're performing, we're always going to have random stray thoughts coming through our heads in the middle of, performances. Yeah. But if you follow that stray thought and you continue to think about it, it's going to derail your performance. You need to be able to let it come through your mind and be like, thank you. That's nice. I'm, I'm performing right now. <laughs> Please come back later. Right. And being able to let go of that and, and bring your focus back to what you're doing is a skill, right? And so Alexander technique, mindfulness meditation helps you work on that skill. So breathing as well, uh, that, that must be part of um, the whole focus idea just taking a few deep breaths you know as the teacher says sit up straight well they then perhaps they've got a point you know uh, but being aware of your breath as well um the other thing i i heard i think this was a, uh, andrew huberman as well just a few deep breaths will actually uh, in, start to increase neurotransmitters uh, and will actually have a, a a chemical change to your to your mental balance as it were you know when i mean when yeah i mean when you when you take a, a slow deep breath it it, um, it tells your vagus nerve, which is like this giganto nerve coming out of your brain. It tells your vagus nerve to, to calm you down basically. Cause the vagus nerve is what controls the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the sort of like restful side of things. Um, and so, yeah, like, you know, what I've always struggled with performance anxiety and people are always like, Oh, well, just take a deep breath. It's like, <clears throat> that's not going to work. Like what, you know, but actually it does like taking slow, deep breaths is the signal to your vagus nerve to turn on and for your parasympathetic nervous system to sort of take over from the sympathetic nervous system, which is sort of this fight or flight response. So yeah, it does, it does change what's going on in, in your body and in your brain. It, it is, it does actually work. Uh, that, which is, which is good to know. Um, cause a lot of these things don't seem to be common knowledge with, with most people, most musicians and, uh, Right. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting to me because a lot of this stuff that I talk about in terms of learning and all, everything is, is common knowledge for athletes, especially elite, elite athletes, Olympic athletes. And, you know, um, but even like high school athletes know a lot of this stuff that their coaches, you know, do, do this in their practices or whatever. And it just, 
isn't common knowledge for for musicians for whatever reason. Uh, my theory is that you know sports has always been a much more like um, scientific field, right? That they're always trying to like, they're measuring their times and they're like, everything is very scientific and measured and sort of optimized. Whereas music is this like artistic thing and you can't measure it and you can't, you know, it's like, no, what we do is mechanical also. Right. And so a lot of these techniques that athletes have been using for a long time to increase their, their performance and their ability to perform well under pressure, pressure, they work just as well for us as musicians. Mm. Yeah, again, it's the blend of the mental and the physical. Right. Yeah. So um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is um, uh, the growth mi mindset that Carol Dweck has had uh, such a good response with. And, and I presume that's, again, that's something that the musician themselves can look at, you know, actually believing that, that the brain is plastic, it can change. And uh, I think it's also known as the Roger Bannister effect. You know, he broke the four minute mile. Before that, everybody thought you'd drop down dead if you tried to run <laughs> a mile in four minutes. But suddenly everybody's belief changed and suddenly everybody else is, is breaking the four minute mile. So, uh, so that your whole belief in, in your abilities, does, does that make a huge impact on, on your playing abilities? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of, my, one of my goals in life is to banish the word talent in terms of, oh, this person's so talented or whatever. No, it has nothing to do with talent. It has everything to do with hard work. And when teachers believe that talent is the most important thing and students believe that talent is the most important thing, it harms everybody. Because if you as a teacher believe, well, a student, if they don't have talent, you know, then they're, they're not going to get anywhere, then you are going to neglect your students that, that, for whom it doesn't come easily at the beginning of learning. Right. And you're going to think, well, you know, too bad for them. Like it's, it's useless. They don't have it. Yeah. They just don't have it. Right. But if you are a student and you, you either have been labeled as somebody that has no talent or you look around at your peers and you see, whoa, other people are picking this up faster than me. I must not be talented. That's going to make you feel terrible, right? And it's going to make you feel, well, what's the point of me doing this? On the flip side, though, if you have been labeled by your teacher as talented or you've labeled yourself as talented because you look around at your peers and then you run into difficulties because you're going to eventually, that makes you think, oh, I must not be talented. Okay, never mind. This is not worth doing. So it, it harms everybody, the so-called talented and the, the yeah. not talented, right? Yeah. And, you know, in every study of every field they've ever done, when they look at natural ability versus hard work, they all come out the same. It's how hard you work and how diligently you work and how much you, you engage in deliberate practice, right? That determines the outcome of how, how well you succeed in, you know, the field as a professional or, you know, as a competitive athlete or, or whatever. Um, yeah. yeah. It, again, it is the, the belief system that, that act, can actually make real changes with, with right. the student themselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, fantastic.